Well, UFO, I suppose, began in a house, a terraced house in Bounds Green, North London. Kind of a class won't invite. Let's just make our break game. Swept out by the rolling waves of the night. Make we chase for fame. We basically used to practice in the back downstairs room until eventually the neighbours got up petition to have us removed. You felt a real strong vibe between the audience because a lot of them knew that we were a local London band and it built up from there. When we started touring places like Germany, uh, polishing up our stage show. Too hard to handle, I'm too, too hard, too hard to handle. We've been looking and looking for someone that had that, the added X ingredient and uh, there it was right in front of us. It was just exciting, you know, and therefore it was a, the best thing.
playing um, in Germany, touring around, and the guitarist we had at that time hadn't turned up, he'd forgotten his passport. The promoter said, well look, it's a university, it's glass uh, panels, glass windows and that, what they're likely to do is they're likely to break the windows if, if you're not, not going to play. And we happened to have uh, scorpions opening for us, and we was on the lookout for a guy, and um, the blonde bomber turned up. And we'd seen them play before, and we, we all liked Michael's guitar playing. And uh, we asked if we could borrow Michael, you know, if he could play with us so that we could get paid, <laughs> basically. <laughs>
think he hesitated slightly. There's a big problem with the language thing because um, Michael didn't really speak any English apart from yes and no. So that was real difficult. The first time we played together was after the Scorpions had played um, in the toilet of the university, uh, well, you know, the changing rooms of the university, got together to tune up and I found out that A was R and B was H in German to actually tune up and we actually had to try and talk to each other in non-English and non-German, if you see what I mean, and actually try and describe what we were going to do. And it's pretty much like going on and jamming for about 45 minutes. In general, I would only meet with the band just to play music. There wasn't really much words necessary. We just, you know, when I had an idea, I just played it. And then again, like, <laughs> I mean, whilst I tend to play in a fairly simple style, or well, I suppose John Paul Jones people like that, who I stu used to like, who had that sort of real solidness, it was good because Michael's guitar was like really piercing and melodic over the top, you know, so it worked quite nicely. Funny enough, uh, at the time, we thought it was fantastic. But the amount of people that we'd play our early tapes to, like on the full set, and, and we'd listen to solos we, we considered to be astonishing. And people go, oh yeah, yeah. Later on, when you got Lights Out came out and we had the success, people going, oh, he, he's great, isn't he? He's great. And you think, hang on, that's the same pe people that we used to try and sort of uh, convince times before. People actually listened to the solos by then, you know, because we had some success in the States. When I first see UFO, the first time I saw UFO was in, I think, July or June 1978 at the Ipswich Gormont, when Def Leppard collectively went on holiday on the Norfolk Broads on a boat before our first ever gig. And uh, they happened to be on down in Ipswich, and we parked up and caught a bus about 20 miles, and off we went. And I bought a T-shirt, a dark blue UFO T-shirt, and it ran and turned brown. I was very disappointed. You still got it? <laughs> yes, I do still have it. I use it as a dishcloth now. Uh, what, are your, what are your memories of that show? Uh, Michael Schenker. Just the image of this guy with the flying V stood there on one side of the stage, all black, flying V between his legs, blonde hair hanging down over his face. Never saw his face all night. And he never moved from the spot. And on the other side of the stage, this maniac bass player called Pete Way jumping up and down, throwing his guitar all over the place. And in the middle, sort of like the balance of the seesaw was Phil Moggo, I thought was like a really cool front man. Didn't launch himself around, didn't look like Robert Plant and sang lyrics that made, that were very of their time, I thought.
I think UFO influenced a lot of bands, but in very different ways. I think um, for stance and poses and, and, and methods of visual things, I think uh, they definitely made a lasting impression on, uh, on Steve Harris. I think he'd be the first to admit it. Oh, definitely. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, you know, mine's been influenced by many bands, but UFO definitely one of them, that's for sure. I mean, Pete Way for me particularly. You know, I mean, uh, playing and posing. <laughs> <laughs> Drinking as well, probably. I thought Pete Way's trousers were absolutely horrendous, but I still went out and bought a pair. So yeah, <laughs> and I think everybody else did. You look at the bass players in those days, everybody had a pair of striped trousers on, you know. I did, Steve Harris did, Brian Wheat from Tesla still does, and it's 1992. <laughs> we were all sort of cruised by the mod thing, so we'd had our ground rules, which were which was Moel's suits, put by Hacks. No. It was something like you had to do that without... It was the unwritten law.
like playing the guitar you know was for me number one priority more than actually being part of the scene you know the motivation for me was like basically to focus on music all the time these days everyone plays this kind of stuff but he was like very much um, just based on the, you know A lot of vibrato and just the way the way he done it was like really very cool, you know. Just, um, just the sound and everything. It was it was a lot different, and it, and it still influences a lot of people, I think. If you're a technical player, it doesn't really matter too much what the sound is like because <coughs> it's so rehearsed and studied, uh, and and you just repeat all the time that it it's um, you have your scales and you just kind of more or less repeat them in a way so that you don't really need any inspiration, it's all there. <laughs> you know, you just have to recall and there it is. <coughs> the way I play, I don't uh, have to remember a lot because usually it is all made up. And, uh, but I get inspira uh, inspiration from the, the sound of the amplifier, how everybody else sounds at that moment. <laughs>
lot of their lyrics, they were, they were hard-edged, but they weren't cliched, which I thought was really cool. do things on extremes, you know, like say do Alone Again or By Love and then do something like real powerful like Hot and Ready, Cherry and you know just things like that where the band can can be real powerful and loud and real good guitar playing. That's the one thing I like about the band which always try to keep a standard of real good guitar playing. Personally my favourite song is Love to Love but um as a classic UFO song, I think probably Doctor Doctor is the one that people really think of UFO for, and um, possibly Lights Out. I like the idea of songs that they obviously meant something to him, and I didn't actually twig what they were about. Things like Lights Out and stuff like even Doctor Doctor. It just had a great image. <laughs> Michael felt that the pressures were a bit too much for him, he needed a break, Paul came in from the band Lone Star and uh, he did the tour, part of the American tour.
go for a cover that was not you know the regular run-of-the-mill cover and hypnosis at that point were turning out real good stuff so we went there usually I you know I was never really involved in in album covers or anything like for me the thing was music and people would say like hey Michael we make an album cover oh yeah okay so I would just follow everybody I would all these people would go in certain direction I would just follow them because you never knew quite how it was all going to come out all you got told was look I want you to do this and it could be from lying on, on your back in a swimming pool to having your hair back and oh, we're going to put Paul bearings in your eyes and stuff like that apparently it was a leftover from a ball bearing advert which they had for a co convention but then they came up with the idea of using the ball bearings and doing it in the LA um, the surgical room there they give me a white shirt, you know, we'll put you in a shirt, we put some bubbles on Phil and on, on Pete, you know. I didn't ask any questions what's behind it, you know, what is it all about, it's just, I just did it. It was just a piece of artwork. Um, Michael wanted to know why he never had any balls in it. <laughs> Their album covers were great. Uh, I thought the, um, the album sleeve for Force It was brilliant. All the kind of bathroom sink and tiles and stuff was great and uh, I, I actually, particularly loved the no heavy petting sleeve with the uh, the woman naked woman holding a monkey with a tube going from the monkey's heart into her neck which I thought was completely strange but typical hypnosis sleeve very odd very bizarre but they were good they, they just made you look at them and think you know what is this and I like album sleeves that do that I think because hypnosis put so much thought into trying to make find something different you felt it was it was on, on a par with the music because of the music you were trying to take it as far as you can because we, we, I believe and I think it was a key factor to the band that we were very competitive in those days we really did care if to be better than Rush or better than ACDC or whatever you know what I mean Judas Priest certainly you know one of my favourite albums is I always loved Obsessions I always thought that was a brilliant record just the sound of it I thought it was the one album where they they got the songwriting right and the actual production right and everything gelled together for that one album. Michael's guitar playing was, I thought, brilliant on that record. But not only that, it was the performance of everybody else in the band seemed to be a, a, a highlight. That and obviously the live album, because the great thing about UFO is that no matter how many albums they would bring out, there would always be like three or four brilliant songs on the record and they would like put them onto a live album so you went out and got bought a live album and it was it was like the very best of UFO which which was like which was fantastic you know so the, the live album to me was also a, like I, it was something that I still listen to even now
I left UFO when they were actually, you see, like I was so focused on my music, I would just play and play and play, and uh, probably subconsciously I would, I was aiming for success, but not really necessarily consciously, you know, and when it was there, and I was, I have been living like this for many, many years, when it was there, and I saw it, I got scared. It was really weird, you know, because all of a sudden you see these people, Schenker is God, you know, and there's all these people like screaming and, and you know, there was all this attention and it, it just kind of from where I was with my music and now seeing this, it was just overwhelming. It was much too much for me. It was after the Lights Out thing, we had tremendous success with that. And um, Things were a little bit, I don't know, there wasn't much contact going on at that point. And I think he just wanted to go, um, and he just went. I was thinking like, now we are successful, or at least we are, it looks like we are going to be very, very big, you know, that means like now I have to tour, I have to play every day, which means I have to drink every day, and da -da -da -da. so I, I just didn't want to, didn't want to know. No, I, I think they still had a, a really strong following and everything when Schenker left and I think that Paul Chapman was a great replacement. I think his playing was superb as well. So as a fan, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it was um, not as good when Chapman was in the band. I still really, you know, went to see him all the time, live and everything, I still enjoyed it. But I suppose because that, you know, the lineup with Schenker was when I first got into the band, you tend to sort of remember that. More, I suppose, it's a classic line, I suppose. But.
different in um, as different in atmosphere too at that point it was more or less it kind of it was a, it was it was an enormous break and I think we, we rushed into it too fast getting someone else and yeah I would say we, we was peaking and we still peaked afterwards but then it, it just um, it wasn't the same we'd lost a lot of impetus you know from losing Michael I think the band actually slightly lacked ideas because I think, no disrespect to Paul Chapman's playing, but I don't think he actually could. He, Paul was a working guitarist and, and a very good uh, fretboard player, but he didn't contribute as much um, to, to quality, I would say, really. You know.
I think the mo the worst moment you get get with any band is it if you've worked an aw an awful long time and hard and you've reached a certain point which I don't think we actually realised where we was at the time and then suddenly it all goes and overnight from being I suppose you could say reasonably well off doing okay and everything and you can turn around and there's literally nothing that's a bit gives you a bit of a jolt but it's not a bad thing I just found it disheartening really I just I just didn't I didn't think the spirit of it was there I mean there was two people that I mean like Neil Carter and Paul Chapman I mean as I say Neil, Neil's a very good musician but I don't think you can replace a vibe by bringing in good musicians <laughs> musicians don't necessarily make for great bands great bands come from the from the spirit of four or five people together you know
was one of those things where we we realised it wasn't as it should be, and uh, we was looking through who did what and where. And, and Ron at that point was kind of done a load of engineer with engineering with the free album, I think, and um, the Stones, Led Zeppelin, The Who, and that. So I mean, it must be pretty obvious that the guys <laughs> okay. I think that possibly the main reason being that uh, things like drum sounds weren't there when, when Leo Lyons was doing it. I mean, I thought uh, Leo, funny enough, captured a vibe which, if it could have been translated sound-wise, um, was actually, he did do a good job with the guitars because um, he would say things like, well, don't worry about um, timing and that, just get your own timing, Make if you want to make it go a bit longer, things like that. And I admired that because it didn't restrict Michael. There is a chemistry between each, like when you put these people together that made Lights Out, Obsession and Strangers in the Night, there is a chemistry that uh, is somehow special. I think Leo caught something which was later on embellished by Ron Neverson. Do you think Ron Neverson made a vast improvement to it? Oh yeah, I mean Ron actually took it to um, a standard that, an international standard I would say, you know.
the way this song came together was very strange because we were just kind of in this <coughs> studio in London and Phil was sitting on a somewhere in the corner reading the paper and we were I had this riff but that was it UFO never really, um, you know, made it so big that they got um, that they got overexposed, but they made it to such a, to a certain point where we stopped. I think that uh, we'll constantly write good songs. I think it's really down to having the right producer. Um, I think it's like anything, you know, you go through a, a phase where perhaps you haven't really achieved what you perhaps could do, or you've let yourself not achieve what you could do. <laughs> Shut up, man, we don't 
The coming of Fritz Kajuku, one one of your early albums, is, is an epic. Like, the legendary. Your yeah, legendary, like Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> Tommy, okay. Can you tell me who wrote the song? It was, uh, it's credited to four of us actually, so we're all to blame. In actual fact, he knows the finer details of it. I was just permitted to sing on it. He was a road manager. He used to drive the transit van because his hair looked like an African prince. <laughs> time and unfortunately I think they they never actually achieve their full potential they, they I personally think they should have been a shitload bigger than they were but they never just when it appeared that they were gonna break really big they they it, it was never fulfilled for some for some reason you try to discover your own personality and you end up stealing you know you wear bon, your Bon Scott from the ankles down and Robert Plant up to the waist and I was Phil Mogg from the shoulders down you know um, they, I think they, I think the thing with UFO is they actually did try, without trying too hard, to break the image of the kind of macho chest beating frontman bit with the shirt off and just the tight jeans. They actually made an effort to look different. Well, I'm driving across the plains, with a streak and lock, hellbound train. I smuggle whiskey. I smuggle gin Where there's a need Well, I just work on it I'm a gambling man Son of a gun I take the risks now, baby I'll make the run Wanna get home now Back in the saddle Ain't gonna drive this kind of Rising across the plain The swiggest drinking like a 
shifting the steel Got a woman with a touch to heal Diesel dust and my wheels are humming So close to home can you feel me coming One step closer to the devil UFO will always be, you know, sort of thought of as um, sort of band you go and say, as a great live band, but in the same, also sort of loose in a, in a way. The best thing about UFO, I always thought, was that they were a gang. They always looked as though they were just like a gang of street kids having a bit of a laugh on stage, and that really appealed to, to me and to the rest of the band back in what 76, 77 when we were forming Def Leppard. It was it was that sort of image that uh, that really got us going and and made us basically influenced us because we we grew up thinking we want to form a band that are like these guys. <laughs> Something I 
People will always talk about Zeppelin and Sabbath and, and Deep Purple and bands like that, but I, for me, uh, bands like UFO would, would, would rank, in my opinion, as, as highly as, as those bands. Give you a spoonful of lies. 
I've, I've played UFO numbers in the past with MSG, and the response of the people is just like fascinating. So for me, it is something that I like to enjoy. I think that uh, we, we can go and achieve a lot. It's just a matter of um, getting down to it and doing it. We never touch drugs. <laughs> We're very clean living lives. Phil's a very generous person. He's actually very, um, not a lot of people re realise what Phil's like actually. He's very, uh, very good vocalist. He's very, uh, he's very uh, artistic minded. I don't mind playing anything. No, it's a problem getting the bass player to remember the notes, you see. <laughs>